Thank you um, all for coming. Welcome to the IISS. My name is Dana Allen. I'm editor of Survival and a senior fellow here. Uh, we have a big panel for a big topic. It's 30 years ago, uh, let's say 30 years ago this season, that an astonishing and mostly heartening uh, series of events happened uh, that we recognize now, and I, as I recall, that we recognized at the time as ending the Cold War. Uh, now, for those of you, and there are people here who are too young to remember, uh, just about everything at the time seemed to be part of the fabric of the Cold War. Even things that maybe we should have recognized were not part of that fabric. Um, I'll give an example uh, that may seem to reflect an historian's kind of professional deformation of tying too, too many things together. But 15 years before the, the dates we're recalling here, so about 45 years ago, an American president resigned his office because of a criminal conspiracy that actually stemmed from domestic battles over, over a hot campaign of the Cold War, which is to say Vietnam. Um, and I'm referring in part to the beginning of the, the plumbers beginning bugling, uh, burglaring uh, Daniel Ellsberg's office, but uh, it's, it's more complicated and more pervasive than, than that. And so, lo and behold, Washington today is gripped by an impeachment investigation stemming from unresolved or perhaps revived Cold War issues, Russian interference in the U.S. election, uh, Ukraine's, the question of Ukraine's independence and place in Europe. So for the second time this week, I'm going to reference William Faulkner. The past isn't dead, it isn't even past. It's not even past. <clears throat> So our panel is comprised of authors and editors of three books, two of which I hold in my hand. Um, uh, uh, three books on the end of the Cold War and the fate of Europe afterwards. And I'm not going to introduce them now because um, we're short on time. Uh, instead, I'm going to lead off with two bundles of questions to different members of the panel. Uh, these concern how these events were understood at the time if we understood them correctly or incorrectly, and then 30 years later, what can we say about the fate of a, vi a vision of Europe whole and free? Um, so I'm going to start with Sir Roderick uh, Braithwaite, who was uh, UK ambassador, and I could get this wrong, but I, uh, uh, since I've written these down quickly, but I believe he was UK ambassador to Moscow in a rather pertinent period from 1988 to 1992. And I mean, I, you know, I guess the question is to reflect very quickly on, how, you know, what did you see happening and did you understand it correctly? Did we understand it correctly? And did we make any mistakes initially? Uh, the answer to this question is mostly yes, yes, and yes. I think, uh, of course, we understood what was going on at the time. It was too dramatic not to. Um, of course, it was a culmination of a lot of events. And I think one of the, the history is very important. People say nobody foresaw it. In 1963, when I was first in Moscow, Khrushchev saw that the system wasn't working. That was in 63. And he set out to uh, do something about it. What happened to him? He was overthrown by the army, the party, and the bureaucracy. And um, when Gorbachev came to power to try and do the same thing, because he also understood that the system wasn't working, um, he, he was less courageous that people thought he should, because he was afraid he'd be thrown out by the army of the Martian KGB. And what happened to him? He was thrown out. So it was, it was a, a, I think, a not incomprehensible historical process. And the point of my intervention, my writing, is, first of all, I think that history was important. And secondly, I think that we <coughs> underestimated and underestimated, and that accounts to some extent for where we are, the hugely strong emotions that lay behind all that. I think history and politics are driven more by emotion than they are by reason. And our failure to understand that, for example, means that we totally fail to understand why the Russians felt so angry after 1991 and still do, <coughs> why that is, uh, Putin feels the same, and why he is able successfully to exploit that now and why we are where we are. <coughs> 
also things like what is Ukraine? You know, there are things that we simply, when in 2013 and 14, nobody in the British press knew anything about Ukrainian history and the relationship between Ukraine and Russia. And so my proposition is that we ignore those things at our great peril. Thank you. Um, well, that's, a, that's an interesting place to start because, I, of course, it is true that at least the politically, let's say, knowledgeable but not necessarily specialist layman looked at an undifferentiated Soviet Union and really didn't... Um, I mean, this was, you know, I guess one of the things that de Gaulle suggested that you're, you're um, underestimating nationalism uh, at, your, at your peril. Um, but Roderick Line... Um, Sir Roderick, you uh, were um, in Moscow from 72 to 74 as ambassador, or? No, 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 no okay. I've been rather young to be ambassador. Yes, yeah, okay. okay. <laughs> um, third secretary. So, but, but, you know, since I mentioned Nixon and the detente era, and um, since, uh, since Roderick mentioned or, or, or referenced uh, you know, the Khrushchevian attempt to uh, recognition that things were, were wrong. What could be seen from, from, the, from the 70s um, about how it was going to end? Um, let me first of all say something that I learned to say when I worked for Roderick Braithwaite from 1988 to 1990, which is, Roderick was right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well. I, I first set foot in Moscow in the summer of 1961 and I was again there in the summer of 1962 as a teenager and it took me about one week to work out that the Soviet Union would collapse it, it was obvious for the reasons that Roderick has given uh, but what none of us could work out was when it was going to collapse but you could see that this was a system that wasn't working uh, in December 1988 when the Armenian earthquake happened there was, at the time, an acute petrol shortage in Moscow. And I remember driving past a petrol station in the middle of the night that had its lights on. So I went in. There was no petrol. I asked the lady in the kiosk why there was no petrol. And she gave me a completely honest and completely irrelevant answer. She said, there has been an earthquake in Armenia. <laughs> and, of course, the petrol for Moscow did not come from Armenia, but from western Siberia. So I asked a second question. I said, then, why are you sitting here at one o'clock in the morning? And she said, because they pay me to do so. And in a sense, that encapsulates the reasons why the yeah. Soviet Union collapsed. And if I could just expand with just a few short observations. I mean, it collapsed not only because of the failure of the economy, but also because Soviet leaders declared that they had resolved the nationalities question, but they never had. They put a lid on it, and as soon as you took the lid off, it bubbled up. Um, the Soviet Union was always held together by force, and it could only be held together by force. Uh, Gorbachev tried to replace force with a voluntary association, and he failed. So then the force fractured, and it proved insufficient. And one notes now, today, that as Putin's position weakens, he is increasingly using force, not yet to the same degree, but incrementally in that direction, uh, uh, to rely on to sustain his own uh, power in the country. Um, your question about whether we could foresee this, or when, I would say that as late as the end of 1988, even early 1989, almost no one inside or outside the Soviet Union could foresee the timing, the speed, and above all, the totality of the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was a quadruple collapse. It was the collapse of the Soviet Empire, the collapse of the Soviet state, the collapse of the Soviet political system, and in a sense, all triggered by the collapse of the command economy. Uh, that is a scale of collapse that has never happened in modern times, uh, in any large country. And it wasn't something that we had foreseen, neither the extent nor, I think, the timing. And I think it could have lasted longer if Gorbachev hadn't tried to change it. Um, for that reason, we were not prepared. And uh, Christina Spohr, in a book that we're not launching today, amazingly, but that she has just launched, the, uh, her wonderful book, Post Wall, Post Square, in the essay with which she introduces it, 
uh, says, nothing had prepared international leaders for such swift and all-encompassing change. They had never formulated a scenario for a peaceful exit from the Cold War. And she's absolutely right. And she goes on to say that we're now dealing with the unforeseen consequences of design flaws in the new order that was improvised with such haste and ingenuity by the shapers of world affairs in 1989 to 1992. Um, So just looking back on this period, I asked myself what was successful and what was not successful. And one has to say that some things in this very unprepared, improvised process went a lot better than they might have gone. Uh, Obviously, the remarkably peaceful breakup of the Soviet Empire. Um, The way in which uh, weapons of mass destruction were kept under control, that was our biggest worry, I think, at the time, particularly the control of nuclear weapons, but also the newly discovered Soviet uh, biological weapons program, the way that the weapons were actually brought in uh, under a single command system uh, from uh, three neighboring countries. I think the relative, relatively successful five years ago, I would have said very successful, integration of the Central and East European countries into the European Union has been a success, a bit tarnished by recent events. And we did achieve 15 years of a very cooperative, deepening relationship with Russia from 1988 to 2003. It more or less ended at the end of Putin's first term, and it certainly ended after after the uh, Orange Revolution and and a whole series of events that have taken us downward since then. Not all that was gained in that period has been lost now, which is why I don't believe that we are in a new Cold War. On the debit side, clearly the Balkans, uh, the failure to um, construct some workable form of European security architecture, uh, and as Roderick has already pointed out, he's always right, uh, we <laughs> overestimated our ability to build a strategic partnership between the West, between the European Union and NATO and Russia, and we underestimated Russia's determination to remain as a significant power in the world and especially to retain control over its periphery. We failed to preempt confrontation between Russia and the West over the in-between states, especially Ukraine, and that's the fundamental reason for the failure of our strategy of building a partnership with Russia and why we're now in a renewed confrontation. Okay, well, thank you very much, and with with your remarks, the the latter part of your remarks, we're moving, in a sense, into the second half of our discussion, uh, which is good, Uh, but before we get there, I want to turn to Christina Spohr, who... um, (laughs) in addition to a position at LSE, an, an ongoing position at LSE, uh, is, a, is the Helmut Schmidt Professor at the Kissinger Center in, at Sice, Washington, which is you know, redolent of everything we're talking about right here. Uh, so, um, I mean, I, I would love if you would you know, s- bring Helmut Schmidt and Henry Kissinger in, in, into the discussion, but if you can't, don't worry. But what I would like to ask you is to elaborate on the quote of yours that that was just made, which is that we didn't have a concept for a for a peaceful e- exit. I mean, having not read your book, title of which is "Post War, Post Square: Rebuilding the World After 1989," I think, and it was apparently, uh, I'm sorry, I missed it. Uh, brilliantly reviewed in the FT. Um, you um, presumably get into this. Yeah. I, I could bring in Helmut Schmidt to the extent that um, I, I wrote a book previously on Helmut Schmidt in the 70s, and the, I, I was interested in him, in him because he was an, a, what I call a statesman intellectual, somebody who had a particular intellectual hinterland with which he set out to be the chancellor and, and, <coughs> and went into the world to create and, and uh, co-make the G5, G7, the European Monetary System, and also in particular how, how he looked at uh, conducting affairs, especially with the Soviet Union, over the dual track. But, I mean, in some ways that is, is, a, is a period before what we get to. And, um, and I would like to point to these two exits I see from the Cold War. First of all, um, if, of course, historians look at this, we think of this as the time of people power, of revolutionary power surges in the street, um, expressions of freedom 
And I was interested in moving away from that narrative equally as I was more interested in moving away from the narrative it's all structural factors, the Soviet economy was collapsing anyway, um, you know, the system in the East didn't work, and, and the question, do leaders matter? What is the importance of the agency of the leaders, and how did they then control and ch channel this power that was out there in the street that was being expressed? And of course it brings together the Eastern and Western leaders. Uh, and what struck me really, you know, if I put a postulation out there was that irrespective on which side you stood, especially in the European or Euro-Atlantic context, there was a spirit of cooperation. And there was a desire to find a common solution to what was going on, which in part Gorbachev had unleashed through his um, policies of perestroika and glasnost and abolition of the Brezhnev doctrine and you know, encouraging the Eastern Europeans to go their own way without, of course, encouraging the uh, collapse of his, of his empire, of the Soviet empire at large, uh, let's say. Um, and of course, what this in some ways led to was this idea that maybe there could be some kind of bipolar partnership working cooperatively with the United States, which in some ways was brought out in 1990 when America, to, uh, under the uh, UN auspices, went to war in the Gulf, and this was supported both by China and especially the Soviet Union. It was really a moment of East-West honeymoon. So in some ways there is what I call the post-war world. This is all tied up with these revolutionary processes and how the, the leaders, Helmut Kohl, um, Mitterrand, Gorbachev, everybody sort of tried to find a solution to uh, engage with these changes, these transformative changes in Eastern Europe, and then in particular over the German question, which in some ways is you know, the, the center of the drama. And here we see how we move into an institutional framework very much based on Western ideas. Um, the way Germany unified, that East Germany got absorbed into, into what were the West German structures, that the Deutschmark became the money for all of Germany, that by default East Germany became an automatically member of the EC, that the EU project continued based on the Franco-German uh, tandem, and of course in some ways that Franco-German reconciliation that had been going on for a long time, we can see also as a catalyst to move really to that Maastricht Europe, so rather than German unification derailing the European integration process, actually Helmut Kohl um, was one of the driving forces for both uh, monetary and, and political union. So that is really quite an important process that came already out of the 1980s. But there is also a design flaw which is actually discussed a lot in Germany right now. There's a lot of sort of reckoning, you know, isn't it awful, the East Germans say, you know, how we got just eaten up by the West German state and how they told us what to do and we lost our living culture and all of this. So what was on an international plane in terms of the victor power rights and of creating stability successful and fast and a window of opportunity was used is experienced certainly by East German citizens by hindsight as, as something that they feel is, is negative. So that's sort of on the debit side of that Western model that functioned so well and that allowed to stabilize. And equally, there was that phrase by Francis Fukuyama, the end of history, this hope this, uh, this dream there was of the universalization of democratization, which we can see both tied to Germany and then of course what we saw in the Eastern Bloc, that capitalism would go hand in hand with democratization, or rather the moving out of the uh, planned economy. And of course we can see over a trajectory of 30 years that this has been in part rejected and that actually we have moved into a recession uh, of democratization. But before I end, I want to show you that this was this is the narrative we think of when we think about the end of the Cold War. I look at this period, 88 to 92, as a hinge years, as a, a time, a process of moving out of one world order into a new world order. And there was a second exit from the Cold War, which is the Chinese exit, the Asian exit. It's quite different. Deng Xiaoping had said, um, with the economic opening but not political liberalization, as you saw through what happened in Tiananmen Square, if the Chinese model in the future is going to be the successful model that supersedes everything else, whenever that may be in the future, then the Chinese will be happy. This has been a trajectory seen you know, with a lo very long review. If you think about what Xi Jinping, Xi Jinping thinks about the vision for 2050, you see the continuation of that thinking. China follows its own compass, it does its own thing. The question is how we, with our value system, here in the West, in Europe, in the transatlantic relationship, also today, engage with that. This is also one of the seeds of the imbalances that we take from this period 
1988 to 1992. We had two exits from the Cold War, but we were all fixated on what I call the post-war world, that excitement of civilizing the world, you know. There was a lot of talk about civilian power. Yeah, political scientists talk about that concept. But that other exit has an impact of what's happened to the balance of power today, that you have China and Russia wanting to challenge that unipolar moment of what became the American victory narrative. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, and thank you, uh, you know, in particular for your, your final remarks, um, which remind me that uh, our mutual colleague at SAIS, uh, John Harper, who teaches um, American foreign policy in, in Bologna, um, in a number of talks I've heard him g give, has, has, has repeatedly emphasized you know, we keep talking about, well, we argue about whether the Cold War was won, whether there were winners and losers, but what people tend to forget is that if there, was, if there were winners, arguably the biggest winner was China. And that's an interesting, uh, different perspective than the one we, we normally have. Um, okay, well, in a sense, we're moving on to the second book now, although I may have gotten confused here. Um, but, uh, you know, we're not going to... I guess, I don't know if you want to fast forward 30 years or, um, or go slowly through 30 years, but in any event, Slavomir, please do it in four minutes. Absolutely. Tell us a little bit about this book. And then. I, will, I will take, Arthur, thank you, thank you very much for um, posting this, this uh, book on share, and I will take uh, uh, some thoughts of Christina as a point of departure for our you know, story in our book. Um, we have to remember assessing what we have achieved during the last 30 years, the starting point, because uh, we tend to forget where we were, uh, let's say, 30 years ago. Uh, and to assess the achievement, we need to have the point of reference. So imagine that it's, let's say, 1984, so only 40 years after uh, the end of the World War II and we have a divided Europe, a divided Germany. We have still um, a Berlin Wall standing. And it, we have only two years after one of the greatest uh, uh, crises uh, in, in relations between the United States and, and Russia, which were on the br where we were on the bridge of nuclear war. So that was the moment when Big Brzezinski writes his article A Divided Europe in Foreign Affairs, when he said that Yalta um, is unfinished business, because Yalta was a kind of the, uh, um, a device how the big powers can deal with each other and how can manage to, to uh, well, keep Europe uh, at peace. So, in 1989, that's the departure of our book, when uh, President uh, Bush, in mind, speaks about Europe falling free, and unification of Germany, and liberation <coughs> of, uh, of countries of Eastern Europe. Unification of Europe, that's the, this big uh, agenda we are discussing in this book. Uh, what, went, what, uh, what actually uh, uh, did, um, uh, well, uh, well, we failed. That's that's the question. Um, um, Christina mentioned uh, Francis Fukuyama fam famous description of of, of this uh, unilateral, unilateral unipolar moment, um, uh, uh, end of history. Uh, Gleb Pawlowski, one of the uh, advisors of, of Yeltsin and and Putin, described this moment completely differently. As you know, for uh, the Western world, for the liberal world, for democracies, it was a kind of the uh, moment of success that our system prevailed, that, that we succeeded in, in this uh, 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 in the ideological struggle. For the Russians, there was a moment when no rules um, applied anymore, because Soviet Union was so regulated. All you know, all rules are uh, you know dr were driven by ideological uh, pattern, and suddenly all of that collapsed. I quoted in my article uh, some polls of, of from the 1990. 90% of Russians correlated normality 
with uh, accepting the Western lifestyle. Thirty-two <coughs> percent believe that the United States, the USSR, should uh, imitate the United States in the future. Seventeen percent believe that it should be Germany, which should be copied as a model of development. And only 4% believe that China should be a kind of the model of development for Russia. That was the moment of 1990. And how uh, the world changed, uh, we can discuss uh, a little bit later. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Dan Hamilton, you and I were... Um, uh, deputy directors of the Aspen Institute Berlin in Berlin um, and I believe I know that I was there after the wall, wall fell and I believe you were there before the wall fell. I was Is there that, when the wall fell. When the wall fell, okay, correct, correct. So we have, we were separated only by a few years but, but have rather different perspectives on, on, on that event. Um, I mean it's also fair to say that in the subsequent years we've had a, a fairly good-natured argument about things like NATO enlargement. Um, and so um, I'm, I'm sort of ready to retire from that argument, given, given, given recent I events. <laughs> but I'd, um, you know, bearing in mind uh, Sir Roderick, Roderick's, Roderick's um, you know, list of problems that we, we misunderestimated, at the, at the, at the uh, outset of post-Cold War. Um, I mean, maybe you want to say something about that. Yeah, thank you, Dana. Uh, just so, because you say you're confused, maybe everyone's confused, just for quickly about these books. So Christina wrote a single author, wonderful volume about the international history of the Cold War, which includes this perspective about China, not just Europe, and it's a great read, and I recommend it. Uh, I co-edited with her this book, uh, with the two Rodericks as part of the uh, uh, contribution. This is a blend of memoir and uh, scholarship. So we asked decision makers from that period to write down you know, what was going on, what were their perspectives, include Russian authors as well as Western authors, Central Eastern European authors. And then we have a postdoctoral program, which our postdocs last year went to the archives. Many of them have been newly declassified and went in and contributed. There's also a really good chapter here on British views on German unification, which I recommend. Um, so this is fully available online. We have copies here, but you can go to our website, transatlanticrelations.org, and it's all there as well. And then I co-edited with Slavomir this other book, which is about the concept of Europe whole and free, as President Bush enunciated it. What did that, what was that about? What happened to it? You know, where are we now? And we have about 40 essays in that book, short ones. And Corey has an uh, article, Ian has an article in there. Uh, and so it's also a good read because it's very different kind of perspectives on, on what it is, just to get a sense of that. So I think I'm supposed to sort of round this out with say, you know, what did happen here? And I, uh, we just echo some of the points that were made that this period, uh, it's, it's interesting, we've been doing this book tour and, you know, younger people, they say, you know, we, we know this was important, but it's really abstract history for us. Really just to say, why did it matter at all? And it's always a good reminder. Uh, for those who did live through it, and I was there on November 9th in Berlin, uh, you have to sort of answer that. And I think, you know, there are a couple basic points. Uh, one made by Phil Zellico and Condi Rice in our book. Uh, if you look at European history, a sweep of hundreds of years of European history, five systemic changes over hundreds of years, each of which, four of which, were accompanied by tremendous tragedy. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, tens of millions of people dead. You know, Treaty, uh, uh, Treaty Westphalia, Congress of Vienna, World War I, World War II, Cold War, and so on. And, and the, the transition to this new world was the only one of five that was peaceful. And so it's worth examining why that would have been. Because in the sweep of European history, it's, not, it's, the, it's the outlier. It's not the rule. Um, and one fundamental question did seem to be answered by that transition time, and that was German unification. That Germany could be unified within a new context of being embedded in a whole series of structures so that all of its neighbors felt comfortable with where that country was going to go. That was not a given 
but everyone, you know, settled around that. But as Roderick, this Roderick said, you know, we also deferred a few questions. We were confronted at the time with the collapse of two multi-ethnic uh, multi entities, the Soviet Union and Yugoslavia. One we helped manage relatively peacefully, the other one we didn't do well. Uh, and 20 new countries, more than 20 new countries have appeared in Europe during this time that didn't exist earlier. Uh, but we, did, we deferred the Yugoslav question, and uh, when I talk about this period, sort of in my view, the end of the Bush administration, uh, it was unclear what we would do with that, with, with that tragedy, whether it was just sort of, sort of some brush fire in a peripheral region of Europe, or whether it was more important. The other question we, uh, the Bush administration left with, because one has to remember that after master, masterfully masterminding the end of the Cold War, President Bush was uh, not re-elected. The American people were going a different direction at the time. They were talking about a peace dividend. They were talking about the economy stupid. They were talking about problems at home. And it was not a given that the United States would remain so engaged as a comprehensively uh, European power as it had been for 70 years uh, at that time. There was a real debate about that. Uh, and that was an open question. Um, so. I think there are some questions that the Clinton administration had to uh, grapple with. First year of Clinton was a mess, uh, and, they, and they didn't answer these questions. But it was only after that that the U.S. came back and asserted rather forcefully, we are not just going to be a power in Europe, we are a European power, we remain comprehensively engaged in the entire architecture of Europe, and that architecture needs now to be built. Bush managed the end of an era Clinton had to help create the next architecture. Uh, and it was not a given that the U.S. would be so comprehensively uh, engaged. And I think it's really important point just to keep in mind uh, as we go forward. And so that this concept that President Bush had laid forward of a Europe whole and free started to become not just a slogan, but an operational approach to Europe and, and, and meant re-establishing the U.S. fundamentally in the European mix. It meant you had to create a new type of architecture that encompassed as much of stable Europe as, as you could, integrating many of these countries. It recognized that the Soviet threat was no longer there, but new threats had emerged all through Central and Eastern Europe, lots of unresolved issues and instabilities, a host of mini Weimar republics, if you will, that we weren't sure of how to deal with and that the fire in the Balkans was not just a brush fire, it would consume that architecture if we did not deal with it. Uh, and that only by re-engaging could, could Europe and the United States finally deal with that. Which meant a whole different role for NATO, but also a new relationship between the US and the EU. There was a whole dimension of this. And that, I think, was trying to give content to this, uh, to this uh, slogan. And I think what our authors say in the book, though, is what has happened. And we have lots of different views. Corey has an article in there, too. I mean, my quick, my quick you know, final Very point quick. about it is just to say, um, I think once we had the Big Bang enlargement, uh, early Bush administration, which is sort of the follow-on to Clinton, it was a bipartisan effort. And the EU then took in all these countries. The next row of candidates were much weaker. Um, the EU and NATO Europe and the United States got distracted by other things and had to digest what we had just done, which taken all these countries. And the Russians decided they didn't like this all very much, and they were now going to oppose it much more than they had uh, before. Uh, and then in the middle of that, a whole conflation of crises started to happen that really either distracted the United States. Uh, the U.S. was much more focused, you know, 9-11 and everything that happened there, lots of other challenges, and had not, you know, figured this wasn't really going to be a high priority. Um, and the Europeans were so consumed by the, you know, the, the construction of Europe and the financial crisis, Eurozone, you name it, not crises, that this sort of whole and free concept just got a back, uh, a back seat. And we didn't, uh, what happened was that the operational project turned back into a slogan. And I would argue that this concept now is simply is not much more than a slogan anymore. 
You've seen it most recently in the EU rejection of the candidacy of, uh, or just to start accession talks with North Macedonia and uh, Albania. So, you know, Mr. Macron's grand vision now, the new vision is a Europe that protects. Uh, my, my response would be, it seems to me that's a Europe that's protecting some Europeans from other Europeans. Uh, and that's and not much of a vision. Thank you, Dan, very much. And I assume some of the questions will bring us into to be forward-looking as you were starting to do. I, I should note that this, the cover of this book has the word Europe kind of separated, and it's not clear. Well, I guess if you see, they're pushing it together, so I guess it's, good, well, it's clear what not. direction it's going in. <laughs> but, um, okay, uh, Corey Shockey uh, is my current boss, and um, for the record, is also always right. <laughs> and that's why um, I'm asking her... Uh, to derive some lessons from everything she's heard. Sure. Um, so, or to do whatever you want, as my based, boss. <laughs> based on what I've heard, I have uh, several points. First, uh, I think the biggest mistake that those of us in the pre uh, end of the Cold War West made is talking about winning the Cold War. The people who won the Cold War are the people of Eastern Europe and former Soviet Union who brought about peaceful change in their own societies. And we do them a disservice and do ourselves an enormous moral indulgence that is wrong uh, to act like we won it. We helped bound the range. They made incredibly brave choices. And a lot of the post-Cold War hubris by the West is directly attributable to getting that moral equation wrong. Second thing I would say is that uh, to take up uh, the point about leaders, leaders matter hugely. Margaret Thatcher and Francois Mitterrand opposed the unification of Germany. If President Bush hadn't been adamant that a unified Germany anchored on the principles of the Federal Republic of Germany was the only way you were going to get peace in Europe, we would have a very different Europe today. So leaders matter hugely. Third, um, Helmut Kohl also matters hugely as a leader because what I remember, I was working in General Powell's military staff at the time, so we had the <coughs> negotiations about does Germany stay in NATO, on what terms, how do you deal with the Soviet Union about this, and one of the kind of thrumming background noises of that period of time was the fact that Helmut Kohl rightly understood that there was a window of time in which German unification was going to be possible and that window was going to close. And if you did not take advantage of what was possible at this moment, you would miss the opportunity for German unification. Next thing, uh, all of us working on those issues at the time were working on it with the consciousness that just as the people after World War II ended had a particular moment in time where you were resetting what the future was going to look like, all of us understood that that's what we were doing at the end of the Cold War, that these were enormously consequential choices, that if you get them wrong, you are going to reset the dynamic in a way that instead of capitalizing on the peaceful unification of Europe that had happened in Western Europe after World War II, that, uh, that we were going to set Europe at least and possibly the entire international order up for violent futures. Um, next, principles. Principles really mattered and that's why Bush's Europe whole and free speech you know, Bush himself rightly derided himself for a lack of vision, but the irony of that is he actually is the guy who gave the vision for the post-Cold War order in Europe. Um, and it, the, the principles all of us were operating under, because the president set them, were that free societies have the uh, responsibility to the people they govern to be free, to be uh, responsive to their people, and second, um, states get to decide for themselves what their alliance relationships <coughs> and their future looks like. 
And that's where we get into the problems with Russia because we all of us tried so hard to persuade the Russians that it's better for you to have stable, prosperous, free countries on your periphery. That's a good thing for you. And the Russians just frankly never bought it and don't buy it now. Um, uh, next to last thing, and that's where it connects to the liberal international order, because we want a rules-based order where sovereignty and self-determination are the dominant principles, and we are having that argument in real time right now, my friends, with the Russians and the Chinese and others. Um, and we here at the Institute spend a lot of time thinking about the rules of the international order, how they get generated, how they get legitimated, um, and what makes them sustainable. And it really matters for all of us to work our way through those problems. And lastly, I, I disagree with Dan's conclusion that the United States got distracted from Europe. What the United States got was a healthy confidence that with the end of the Cold War and the collapse of the Soviet Union and the emergence of free societies in former Soviet and Warsaw Pact states, that the security problems of Europe were now of a magnitude that Europeans could largely manage and the United States felt other pressing problems demanded it. That's not distraction, that's strategic judgment based on the strength and competence of our European allies. Okay. Can I just say two quick sets? First of all, strategic, in my view, misjudgment. Fair enough. But I think the point about this whole discussion is that is really Christina's point. We are talking, as we always do, as a, from a North West white European American perspective. The world is full of other people. China, obviously, but Russia, like R Russia, has also got every f 300 years. Russia collapses, and everybody says Russia is finished. Each time that turns out to be a mistake, and it seems to me that this discussion needs to be given a broader context because it, I think Holland feels exactly right. We had no choice, but all solutions generate new problems, and we fail to take account of, and we're still to some extent failing to take account of the fact that China emerged, as Christina describes, and Russia never went away. And whether we like or not what they do is not very important from the policy-making point of view. What we need to do is work out what it is they are going to do and see how to accommodate that. And we've not been very good at that, in my view. No, Accommodating that is not the only sorry, policy can I choice. Use, no, no, Countering sorry, that is also sorry, a policy I, choice. I, uh, accommodate, like legitimate, are words that have all sorts of unfortunate implications. Accommodate is what you do to real life. It doesn't mean so you give in to the other side. It really doesn't. It means manage or any verb you care to take, but it doesn't mean saying we have to uh, accommodate in that sense the word to what Mr. Putin is doing. Of course we don't. We have to devise ways of dealing with it. Okay, well I'm, I'm pleased that we already have a debate here. Now I have, I have two um, two members of the panel who also would like to respond. Uh, can you do it very quickly? Absolutely. And then um, I want to open it up to the floor. As a part of the this, this discussion, uh, we have to bear in mind that one of the greatest uh, lessons out of, the, out of the 1989 and end of 80s was that actually uh, the Soviet system doesn't work. And you know this uh, managed economy is simply not effective. But then we somehow uh, believe that our success is a kind of universal, and China would develop exactly in the <coughs> same way as Russia did, and the China would arrive exactly to the same conclusions as we did. And that was a mistake. We accepted in the 1990s. Uh, um, uh, the idea of, of our Chinese counterparts that one, uh, one state, two system would work. And we believe that it would be good enough to cooperate because China would open our, uh, the, the market for our products and then we would trade and trade would change everything. That was a mistake. Because now we have one system in China which is, let's say, based on the values on, uh, of, of our world and another system which is based on unfreedoms. 
and these two systems cannot merge. And now we have to compete with the autocratic uh, power. Okay, thank you. Professor Spohr. Just want to say about this point of um, <coughs> our rules-based system and um, self-determination and sovereignty and integrity of territory, that there was, of course, immediately already in 1992, 1993, the problem that um, we, we saw that who would support the Bolts in their self-determination drive, um, how should we deal with Yugoslavia, that's where we have a strategic misjudgment, should we hold on to it as a territory, or should we support the individual nations in their self-determination, and then of course, and that's where America, for example, didn't get involved straight away, because it was felt, you know, that is a European problem, the Europeans have to deal with it, they couldn't, the EU wasn't ready, and thirdly, Somalia, that's where the Americans under the UN again went in, but there was a problem, can you engage inside a territory in a civil war, the, the judgment was made maybe one can because actually the, it was ungovernable, it was a decomposing state. So already in 1992-93 we saw the initial problems, even if we wanted to govern in a, in a rules-based international kind of way, and we had already crisis which we found very, very difficult to manage. Great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to open it up to the floor um, and try to apply the same um, rigorous discipline. Please identify yourself and um, make your point, preferably question, very concise. Um, and I'll take a round, so please write these down and choose which ones you, you, you want to respond to. Um, one person who hasn't raised his hand is Ian Bond, and he doesn't need to. Come on, Ian. But he is a contributor. You might think, uh, I'll come to you later, perhaps. But, uh, <laughs> uh, let me start unusually in the back. The, the, the woman, lady holding her hand up. Hi. Uh, uh, I'm the Foreign Office. I wanted to ask Christina a question, please. Um, you talked about East Germany being subsumed into West Germany. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, in light of the elections last Sunday, how do you see um, AFD's rise in Eastern Germany as rooted in the dissatisfaction Good with question. the post, um, end of the Cold War order there? Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to bundle okay, you, okay. so um, yes, you, sir, please. Yeah, um, thank you very much, uh, Ewan Grant, um, former law enforcement intelligence analyst covering the Soviet Union, worked in EU missions in Ukraine, saw uh, the end of the Soviet Union because of the nationalities problem on a Soviet warship in 1983. Total division between the nationalities, thought they got serious problems, didn't know where, of course. My question is... Um, based on a point Sir Roderick Braithwaite made at the end about um, not solving, joining everything up. How, um, what progress, if any, is being made for the EU member <coughs> states, um, including Britain, this isn't the Brexit issue, um, the EU central bureaucracies and the growing common organisations, and the US and Canada, five islands, <coughs> to look at all this together um, in Russia, of course, it's a dry run for China. Thank you. Okay, what, thank what are you getting right, what not? Okay, thank you. That's a big demand, but uh, we'll see. Yes. Yes, um, my name is Andre Gusaru, intern at uh, the Institute. Uh, first, I wanted to thank all the speakers for the interesting thoughts on the uh, dynamics during the Cold War and uh, during the post Cold War era. Uh, my question is addressed to Dr. Spohr, but of course, uh, I would be more than happy to hear the thoughts of uh, every speaker. Um, you've mentioned uh, uh, a great point on the hinge years from 1988 to 1992 uh, on the New World Order forming uh, with the Chinese exit and uh, China following its own compass and uh, China challenging the unipolar moment with Russia. Uh, maybe uh, the question can be addressed uh, from uh, an Organsky rising power theory, uh, but it is interesting to ask whether uh, you think in the uh, distant future, there's going to be a challenge to the uh, current world order uh, led by the U.S. shifting from a bipolar wor a world order to unipolar, multipolar, and now to a potential bipolar world order uh, between the U.S. and uh, China in terms of uh, challenging the U.S. both in soft and hard power. Uh, do you think there's going to be a potential trade war? Okay. Um, Ali. Uh, yes, Ali Arsalan, Russia Intern at the Institute. Thank you, everyone, uh, for your speech. Um, my question is for Dr. Shaki and uh, Professor Hamilton. Uh, it's, it may be a 
long durée type of question, but is there a lesson that global powers can learn from the United States about maintaining territorial integrity and sovereignty? Because the 20th century has seen empires rise and dissolve, uh, the Soviet Union has uh, dissolved, the European project is suffering because of Brexit, maybe a Frexit or a Grexit, but the United States has maintained uh, a collection of 50 very different states all together. Is there something that the rest of the world is missing, and if so, what is that? Well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, you do, we did have a rather nasty civil war um, that, that, that resulted in us staying together, but um, okay, I'm uh, I think I'm going to have to close it there. I was going to offer, sorry. Second round. I don't see. Oh, OK, yes. Hello, I'm Eddie Kaiser. I'm also an intern at the Institute. I would like to um, combine the two points. Uh, Colin Chucky, you said that um, governments of the free society, they are advised to be responsive to the citizens. And um, so, uh, Roderick? You said that uh, the Soviet Union was held together by force and that um, nowadays you can see similarities also to Putin. And then I would like to combine with the last statement that there are also um, many other people in the world and there may be different perspectives. So are there maybe similarities also to the European Union that right now could be seen that is held uh, together by force? Okay, very good. And I'm going to take one last comment or question from one of the co-authors in the Center for European Reform, and before that, the Foreign Office, Ian Bond. Thank you. I'm not actually going to talk about anything that I wrote about. I want to ask you a subject, which is, um, we, we misinterpreted, in a sense, some of the lessons of the break of the Soviet Union and projected them onto China and said, you know, the Chinese system is bound to develop in a certain way. Do you think there's anything that the Chinese took from the breakup of the Soviet Union that is equally misconceived? Um, in other words, you know, for example, it's a their great question. Policy, you know, they, have, they, have they also drawn some wrong lessons? Okay, very good. So Chinese wrong lessons, uh, similarities, lessons from the U.S. on maintaining territorial sovereignty and possibly the EU as well in an obviously different way. Uh, challenges on world order, what, um, my notes aren't very clear on this one, but you guys have it, and uh, East Germany and the AF Day. Maybe I'll start with you, okay. Christina, and then, um, and then, and of course I have to ask everybody to keep it to two minutes. So. Yeah, one minute for AFD. Um, AfD is very interesting. The last election we just saw in Thuringia, actually we must not overlook that it was won by Die Linke. So uh, the, it's the Linke and the AfD who both together have more than 50%. So it's a, it's a two French parties. AfD is interesting because in the previous Länder elections um, about a bit more than a month ago, um, also the AfD did very well. And the slogans were Wende 2,0, in other words, the term 2.0. Um, and we are das Volk, we are the people, using again the slogans from 1989 and totally abusing history in this respect. Uh, trying to sort of say that they're the Germans who aren't hurt and they're being flooded by these immigrants, considering that this, this, these were in places where you hardly had any uh, of those refugees that came three, four years ago. Um, so what you see actually, and if you look at it historically, that there is a problem in East Germany also how you have learned from history in terms of nationalism and in terms of what, what um, I talked about with unification. Yes, that particular segment of society, they're not the anti-Euro people like the IFD people who are in the west of Germany, they're the people who sort of, um, although technically their living standards have much improved and their situation is actually relatively good also compared to what you see in Eastern Europe, they don't look at what, at what happened in East Germany in relation to Eastern Europe, they look at the mirror image in the West, which is of course a problem that was there right from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And of course, as I said before, there was that element of, of absorption and certainly some, some aspect of how the elites handled it probably wasn't the best. But the problem really is that it's so inward looking. And it's not really taking a comparative perspective, both within Germany at large, because you could say, well, things aren't great in the rule, uh, and, and looking at their situation in comparison to Eastern Europe. And it's really in this horrible nationalistic uh, resentment, because there's an unmastered past, an unmastered Nazi past, and an unmastered East German past. This hasn't been really developed. So that, that's my quick answer to that. 
uh, on, on the multipolarity, unipolarity question, I wouldn't say that there's a new bipolarity coming. Even Gorbachev talked about that surely after bipolarity, if you have partnership, you're moving to something much more multipolar. The word multipolar isn't a new thing. In fact, even in the Cold War, there was talk about maybe tripolarity. Multipolar is perhaps more, more fluid. And I absolutely do think that, um, I mean, Lavrov has said it, he wants to move into a post-West uh, world order. Uh, the Chinese have talked about polycentrism. I think they're very clear in that what they want is to um, challenge and undermine what they perceive as American hegemony, much more than even unipolarity. And finally, um, the lessons... Uh, the wrong lessons drawn by the Chinese. I don't know, I'm not Chinese, so I don't know what they would perceive as the right or the wrong lessons. They certainly drew very um, knowingly lessons from what happened in Eastern Europe because uh, Deng gave uh, Gorbachev a big lecture that everything he was doing in the Eastern Bloc was wrong, that you can't let people have free choice, that you must not do this glasnost business. And the Chinese conclusion was that you stamp out nationalism, and we see this to this day with the Uyghurs. So, uh, we might say that they take the wrong lessons, they might say they take the right lessons because they want to hold this together and they will certainly make sure, maybe in a more cunning way now in Hong Kong because they're not bringing out the tanks, but they're finding other ways of keeping this under control. So the mainland and holding it together, that is their, their path. They think that they have drawn the right lessons. And because we are not challenging, even verbally, properly, as, as a united front, for example, human rights, even through the UN or any other means, they feel in some ways maybe they have a bit of a free hand. So I would perhaps frame it that way. Okay, thank you very much. Um, for the rest, I'm going to go in reverse order, starting with Corey Shockey. I'll just answer the U.S. question, which is that the U.S. is a bad model to draw lessons from writ large. Um, because that our structure of government is so complicated with local, state, and federal authorities with the constant invitation to struggle between the judicial branch, the legislature, and the executive. Um, and not only because, as Dana said, uh, we fought a civil war, um, but also we fought 571 separate wars with Native American tribes. Uh, and so it's not a peaceful history, it's a history of violence, and it's a history of deep disputation. But the fundamental um, glue of the United States is that there's no substitute for winning the political argument, right? We have, big, we have a system structured for big, loud, continuous arguments that slowly, slowly shape a common consciousness among the American people which is best summarized by the British historian Bertha Ann Reuter in 1923. Americans are a people so extreme in politics or religion or both that they could not live in peace anywhere else. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Hamilton. Well, like, since Corey addressed that, let me, I just want to turn this one point which comes up about multipolarity. What's the future we're looking at, China, all of that. And, you know, I just refer you to one chapter in this, this one book by David Gompert, one of our colleagues who was in the Bush administration. We, we spent a lot of time, time on how the Cold War ended. His chapter is why did it end. Uh, and it goes back to what a few co commentators have said, that one causal reason, he would argue, structural reason, deep current reason, is that they could never master the information revolution. The information revolution of the early 80s that started to start to really come about just laid all of the inequity and inefficiencies of the, that system bare, and they just couldn't keep up. And so it wasn't necessarily, you know, all the cold warriors winning the cold war with some people in garages in California inventing the world in a different world. Uh, so we weren't prepared for the end of the cold war, but we also weren't prepared for that world that we now live in. So when we talk about multipolarity and all the big great power, I would argue, you know, that's a very state-centric view. And maybe it's useful to just take a pause and overlay that with what I would call a network-centric view. The state-centric view is always, whose side are you on? The network-centric view is, who are you connected to? Uh, and in the world we're facing today, some of the network-centric issues uh, could catch us by surprise. And it's also changing at a speed that is far more rapid than the state-centric world. The question for the state-centric world is how do you grapple with the, the underlying currents of change? And which powers, then, will best be able to grapple that? 
Uh, and so I, I do believe that uh, rather than talk about hard power, soft power, civilian power, much of the concept I use is spectral power, which is which country has all of the resources from soft to hard and can use them quickly, nimbly, flexibly uh, to address issues. Dan, I'm sorry. And, I, and the last part of the sentence is to say, I don't believe China can do that. Uh, it can do it in some ways, but it can't do it in other ways. I think the United States still can do most of that, although we're having a big debate. Okay, Thank very good. Thank you. Um, Slava Mir. Well, I briefly about this, uh, the, this concept of uh, network-centric world. Uh, it overlaps with a kind of the ideological struggle we are still again, we are again uh, involved in. I mean, we have uh, a free world from the one side, and we have uh, China and Russia, which are, you know, uh, based on armed freedom. And, you know, if we uh, uh, um, imagine that uh, China may control uh, uh, new technologies in the future, which could effectively can block uh, both democratic countries' uh, uh, um, cooperation with, with the others, particularly neighbors of the EU. Uh, we, we can realize that it is not only about ideologies, it's not about technologies, but again, we could uh, end up with a competition of, uh, between uh, uh, you know, states and, and, and powers. So it is not either or. It could, or both these, you know, uh, descriptions can can overlap, and in the end, we can uh, we can, you know, uh, end up with a classical rivalry of big power. Okay, great, thank you, um, yeah. Sir Roderick. Sir Rod Roderick. No. Question of whether there was an analogy between the USSR and the EU being held together by force. Um, the point about Putin was that initially he succeeded in making himself a very uh, popular leader by being responsive to the man and woman in the street and articulating his and her views. Uh, now that his popularity, after a very long time, is on the wane, of course he is resorting increasingly, as I said, to authoritarian methods. When you look at the EU, one of the big mistakes of the EU in the 1990s was that its leaders drove for integration at a speed that ignored very considerable resistance by peoples across Europe, and not just in Britain, but Denmark, Ireland, referendums lost in both countries, France arguably the referendum was fudged, not necessarily clear that they won their Maastricht referendum, resistance in countries like Greece. They ignored the importance of identity to the people of Europe. They said, this is the medicine that is good for you, and you take it. They're making the same mistake now, and they have made it in recent years, with the left-behind countries of Central and Eastern Europe, uh, and again, ignoring the importance of identity politics in those countries. It's, there's a certain level of arrogance uh, uh, and denationalization that happens among the leadership in Brussels. And it's not just about the British. It's not just about Brexit. There is a real fundamental problem there. I wouldn't say it's being held together by force, but I would say that ordering people to do things ultimately doesn't work. And that's why the EU is under a lot of strain at the moment. Great. Th thank you. Last. Well, I mean, first of all, on the United States, it seems to me the United States is held together because it has a unique history. That's not the same as exceptionalism, but it comes from a single ideological thing, which Europe simply doesn't. It's a nice point. It's a, it's a so far a monolingual country, which Europe simply isn't. So I don't think, I think why it holds together is, it, compared with the rest of us, is actually not, a, not very difficult to understand. The other thing I'd like to endorse what Rod said, you talked about being responsible for your citizens. Well, responsible and citizens are both loaded words. Being responsive to your people is what Putin thinks he was, and actually was, as Rod says to start with. And I talked about three Chinese in the course of my life, but they all think China's doing the right thing. Now, I think they're piling up trouble with the Uyghurs. Of course they are. But for most Chinese, they are doing what they think China should be doing. And uh, the government recognizes that, um, the Chinese government. We don't like it. And I think one of the problems when we talk about these things is that we are too often prescriptive rather than descriptive. We need to see what's going on and then decide how to accommodate ourselves to it by producing, if you like, 
a NATO. That was a way of accommodating to a problem. Depends on your vocabulary. Okay. Uh, ending on a in semantic point, which I think is very interesting, I think that we will um, close only a couple minutes late. Uh, two of us have to get off to another meeting, but I really want to uh, th thank all our panelists and ask you to join me in thanking them for a very interesting <laughs>